And I'm really, really excited about our presentation today. And before we actually introduce our presenter, I would like to thank our chapter member, Ferenc Kovacs, for making this uh, presentation uh, possible. He contacted Moritz, our presenter, to ask if he would be interested in doing this. And they've been carrying on a conversation for several months now uh, to make this happen today. So for those of you who saw the title, I mean, I'm thinking that you were probably like I am, and you're wondering, what's Brain Computer Interface or BCI technology? So BlackRock Neurotech has been using this technology in a wide variety of situations. One of them that they've been really working on is in mobility issues. And Moritz is overseeing a program that they have that's for hearing, and it's called Hear Again. And Moritz, would you like to share your presentation or are you just going to talk? I forgot to ask you. I will share my presentation. Uh, okay. Thank you for the introduction, Anne. Uh, let me stop sharing and make sure you can share. Okay. There you go. Okay, perfect. Um, let's see. Okay, can everyone see uh, the title slides in presentation mode? Uh, we are just seeing the title slide. It's perfect. Okay, fantastic. Well, uh, thank you so much, Anne and uh, friends, for having me here. Um, very nice to meet you all. Uh, please let me know if I need to speak up or speak more slowly, same as Anne. Um, I will talk to you a little bit about our um, uh, project to develop an auditory nerve implant as part of our efforts to develop brain computer interfaces. Um, I generally kept this presentation to uh, a general public, um, but I'm more than happy to uh, address also deeper technical questions um, after the presentation. So. About my background, um, you can probably hear it from my accent. I grew up in Germany. Um, I am currently leading the um, Here Again business unit at BlackRock Neurotech, um, which focuses on applications of brain computer interface technology uh, to restore or convey hearing. Uh, to improve also uh, the hearing quality of existing uh, auditory implants and prosthetics. By training, I am an engineer um, with a strong focus on bioengineering, uh, microelectromechanical systems and materials. So I will briefly give an introduction about our company and brain computer interfaces in general uh, before then diving more into the auditory applications. So BlackRock uh, is a privately held company that was founded back in 2008 in Salt Lake City, Utah, um, originally under a different name as a spin-off from the University of Utah, where the so-called Utah Electrode Array was developed, which is a microelectrode array that was designed to be implanted into the brain. Um, with the goal to exchange signals and information between um, machines, computers, and the human nervous system uh, through a like an array of small electrodes that transmit or convert electrical charge into ionic uh, currents, which is um, the, the, the information mechanism that is used in the human nervous system. Uh, we currently are just above 100 employees. Um, we we are one of the first, if not the first company that actually um, developed brain computer interfaces that uh, were implanted in humans. Um, as Anne mentioned, the, our primary focus for several years was motor and sensory restoration for um, quadriplegic patients. To date, we have about 32 uh, BCI participants, so 32 patients that were implanted with our technology, currently seven uh, still active at this point, um, with over 30,000 days um, 
of um, implantation duration cumulatively. In general, our mission is to restore human function and rem remedy neurological diseases. Um, our marketing team likes to call it, make, help people walk, talk, see, and hear again. Um, speaking of our marketing department, I would like to share a three minute video that presents um, the company and also shows uh, some of our patients um, that were implanted with our technology. And it's truly impressive to see what they were able to do again. So all of the patients in this video uh, suffered a spinal cord injury that um, left them paralyzed from the neck or the chest down typically. And using that technology, we were able through prosthetics, robotic limbs, sensors, able, we were able to restore uh, sensory function and motor function. Now, um, let's quickly see if the video plays with sound. Um, can you hear the sound or do I need to change something on Zoom? I don't hear any sound. Okay. When you check, when you shared your PowerPoint in Zoom, there's a checkbox at the bottom there for um, audio and video. Okay, let me see. Oh, here we go. Yes. That robotic hand went closed like that. Man, I come by. Yeah, I want to come out of that chair so bad. I said, my goal is to feed myself chocolate. I firmly believe that we're at the onset of a revolution. I was able to move the mouse around on the screen like it was me moving my hand with a mouse. Uh, it felt pretty awesome, you know? I only imagine where the technology can lead. We provide a neural interface platform that has a wide range of applications. Uh, what we want to achieve and enable is that people can move again, feel again, talk again, hear again. I think we'll have people playing the piano and being concert violinists. Come on, seriously? I think it goes back to the fundamental question of what you want to do with the time that you're given. We're just at the right point and things are really taking off. There you go. Understanding our brain and also curing disabilities and mental health issues like depression is the real final frontier. Okay, so this was a brief video that showed a little bit of what was achieved so far already with this type of technology. Um, Although this presentation is mostly focused on hearing applications, um, I'm more than happy to, to take also any questions at the end of the presentation about uh, all the other applications that we're working on. Um, okay, so as um, already mentioned, uh, brain-computer interfaces have a variety of applications. Um, just some of the key areas that we're focusing are um, our move again, talk again program, which restores um, motor function, sensory function, but also allows people with locked in syndrome, for example, to communicate again um, through um, basically typing words or thinking about sentences that then get translated and are being able to uh, able to be displayed on Microsoft Word or Outlook. And so it, it helps with communication. Then here again, which is the business unit that I am leading that um, focuses on brain computer applications uh, for the auditory system. 
Um, and a third big business unit uh, in our company that um, looks at the treatment of epilepsy, monitoring and treatment of ep epilepsy. For the next slides, I think you're all more than aware of this, so I'm not going to spend too much time on it, but there are um, different reasons for hearing loss, um, three main categories, sensory, neural, conductive, or mixed. Um, happy to to take any questions there but i think you're all more than familiar with it so i'm going to jump right into the technology here so there are different uh, types of auditory implants and i want to clarify i'm mostly focusing on implants now not on hearing aids um so the most successful neural prosthetic today uh is the cochlear implant uh with over 1 million cochlear implants being implanted uh, as of last year worldwide. Um, this isn't a, a prosthetic or an implant that uh, conveys sound or speech information through stimulating um, the, the, the auditory nerve from within the cochlea. Um, a smaller um, group of implants are the brainstem implants. This is uh, a device that has been developed to address the needs of um, patients that do not benefit from a cochlear implant due to a malformation of the cochlear, a destruction of the cochlear due to an accident, for example. Um, there's a combination um, of cochlear implants and uh, Acoustic stimulation, so basically a combination of a cochlear implant and a hearing aid, which is called uh, EAS, um, where the cochlear implant conveys more high pitch frequency information, whereas the hearing aid in combination with it conveys low pitch uh, information. And then we have two implants. Uh, well, we don't, there exist, there are two implants that exist um, that purely work through uh, mechanical stimulation. Uh, those are more used for uh, conductive uh, hearing loss. Um, the middle ear implant that translates mechanical energy, so basically the sound waves directly into the um, um, into the middle or inner ear, and then a bone conduction implant, which I think is a brilliant piece of engineering that um, vibrates the cranial bone to uh, transmit. Uh, sound information uh, directly to the middle or inner ear. Um, so why, with the successful cochlear implant, why is there a motivation or a need to um, develop a different type of implant? So, um, and apologies if this is uh, all too familiar to some of you, but I'm just going to briefly explain how a cochlear implant works and what have been technical limitations over the last decades that have not been addressed yet. So a cochlear implant works uh, by wearing a speech processor that is equipped with a microphone behind the ear that uh, collects sound information processes it and transmits energy and information through a radio frequency, an RF coil, through um, the scalp to an implantable stimulator. Um, you can see the receiving coil here as number seven, that then delivers or generates small currents or charge that are uh, guided through a, a cable to an array of contacts or an electrode array that is implanted in the cochlear, which is this snail house shaped structure. Like um, from there, the current um, stimulates through the liquid inside of the cochlear and the bony wall, the bony structure of the cochlear, uh, the auditory nerve um, fibers that you can see. It's this yellow part here. Um, the cochlear has a tonotopy, so it means that the nerve fibers connecting um, at the very, or like the, the, the proximal end of the cochlear um, are sensitive to high frequencies. And as you move along, you move more and more towards lower frequencies. And so when you deliver a charge, it's, uh, shown here by this red shaded area from, let's say, this 
electrode. Um, those are just platinum rings that deliver charge. Um, you can see that this charge spreads then through the liquid and the bony wall to reach um, electrically excitable nerve cells. And this is also, this is how it works. So basically after like this charge activates the nerve cells and creates action potentials that are then passed along to the um, uh, to, to the midbrain, the cortex, um, and travel along the, the, the auditory pathway. But as you can see here as well, this is also the limitation um, of these uh, implants. It is uh, limited in a way of the um, frequency resolution that you can convey. So you, it's basically imagining um, a, a sharp image uh, compared to a pixelated image. So you're basically digitizing information and sound information. So now one could say, well, this is an easy thing to address. We just add more electrodes, more contacts, and therefore we can convey more precisely um, and uh, frequencies at a much higher resolution to the auditory system. This, however, is not possible just due to the physical limitations of these electrode contacts being immersed in a fluid environment first that has a very high electrical conductivity, so the current spreads. And then it has to overcome um, material of high electrical resistance, which is the bone structure of the cochlear, until it reaches the fibers. So you have, if you stimulate one single electrode, you have charge and current bleeding into neighboring areas and activating more than just a very small population of nerve fibers. This is till today like the fundamental limitation um, that cochlear implants have and results in experiences and um, for, for certain individuals to have difficulties hearing in noisy environments with a cochlear implant or listening to uh, harmonic pitches like music, for example. So how do we address or like what is our plan to address this? Um, as you saw from the presentation, we started by developing very, very small implantable electrode arrays, uh, several orders of magnitude smaller than contacts uh, from a cochlear implant. And our device was specifically developed to interface directly with um, neurons and with uh, neural tissues. So be it the brain or nerves in the peripheral nervous system one of those nerves being the auditory nerve. So our effort here is to replace the electrode array from conventional cochlear implants with our micro electrode array uh, that has very, very small contacts, just as a um, like an order of magnitude to compare our electrode contacts are just a fraction in size compared to the diameter of a human hair. They're about five to five to ten times smaller. Um, so really, really small, delicate structures, which then allow to very selectively activate specific nerve fibers and specific regions of either the brain or or the nerve. Um, so in principle, it works the same way. Sound is collected by a microphone uh, through uh, a speech processor or sound processor that is worn behind the ear, then transmitted through an RF coil to an implantable stimulator, and then delivered not to the cochlear, but directly to the auditory or cochlear nerve to stimulate. Uh, this idea has been in the field or has been discussed in the field for uh, years now. Um, the limitation here was always the electrode nerve interface um, that is typically one of the major material and uh, engineering challenges when developing brain computer interfaces. So much for the motivation. Now let's dive a little bit into the technology. Um, brain computer interfaces, whether it is a system to restore motor function or sensory function, um, or for hearing applications, all have kind of the same structure. You have an electrode array, which is 
basically the interface between your solid state technical electrically conducting system and the nervous system of the human body. You have a head stage, which is um, a device that uh, does initial um, signal processing um, and also often serves as a connector um, between the electrode array and then any computer processing system which is the neural signal processor. And this then interfaces with software applications, prosthetic limbs, uh, any of it. So how would that look for uh, an auditory um, prosthetic? So in this way, we're only transmitting information in a single direction. So we have speech or sound that is collected by a microphone uh, and processed in a sound processor that then is transmitted to uh, through an RF link to an implantable stimulator that is then transmitted to the electrode array that stimulates uh, the nervous tissue. How does such a device look like? So at the very beginning of our studies, we still worked with uh, percutaneous connectors that we also still use for uh, our motor and sensory applications. Um, this is the so-called UTA electrode array. So this is the actual interface that, um, that delivers charge either from a solid state conductive system to the biological tissue or vice versa. So as you can see here, it's an array of, in this case, 100 silicon-based microneedles. Um, this is the portion where I mentioned that this is just a fraction of a human hair in diameter in size um, that is then penetrating the nervous tissue. And at the very tip of each of these columns or pillars, um, we have our microelectrode that then delivers the charge. So this is our cortical array that we use for motor applications. And for the peripheral system, for the nerves, we had to, especially also for the auditory nerve, we had to make a couple of modifications. One of the modifications is to have a slanted um, shape of our electrodes. And the reason for that is that you can assume a nerve to, be, um, to have a circular cross-sectional area. And we want to make sure that we interface with the entire cross-sectional area of the nerve. This is the reason why we have kind of this stepped or sloped geometry. This device specifically has been developed for the auditory nerve. Um, it has fewer electrodes, fewer contacts. The reason for that is just um, at the dimension of the auditory nerve, which is about one to 1.5 millimeter in diameter. And apologies, I'm still not quite used to the imperial uh, system of measurements, so I'm going to talk in millimeters. Um, we also had, because the surgery is a little more complex than inserting a device into the motor cortex, for example, we had to add a couple of handling features that make it easier for the surgeon or the medical personnel to manipulate this array. Um, the device, how it looks right now, um, this is uh, done with our partner on the project, and I'll talk a little more about our consortium and partners in a bit, but we're working with Medell, um, one of the main cochlear implant companies based in Austria, Europe. And as you can see, we're using exactly the same technology in terms of processor, coil, and stimulator as a conventional cochlear implant. So from the outside, it's impossible to tell whether someone is wearing a CI or a cochlear implant or an auditory nerve implant, with only the difference being here, that little electrode array that is uh, implanted into the auditory nerve. I would like then to move on and talk a little bit about the process. And well, now we have an idea, we have a concept, we have developed a prototype, but how do you get clearance and how do you test it? So the first step is always for any medical device, especially when it's as invasive as uh, neural implants, you have to do some basic testing uh, on animal models. So the very first one was not safety or efficacy, it was more a proof of concept. 
And so this is work that was done by um, our partners at the University of Minnesota. Um, they wanted to demonstrate that you can indeed have um, more targeted stimulation when stimulating directly from within the auditory nerve compared to stimulating from within the cochlear. So they used a guinea pig model um, where one microelectrode array was implanted into the auditory nerve and another electrode array was implanted into the auditory midbrain or inferior colliculus. Um, the electrode array that was implanted in the auditory nerve delivered charge and stimulated the nerve at different locations, whereas the electrode array that was implanted in the midbrain recorded the response of the auditory system, collected uh, basically action potentials, or as we call them, like to call them spikes, um, as a response to the stimulation. And why is this important? Um, the cochlear, as mentioned before, has a very well-defined tonotopy. You have high frequency sensitivity at the proximal end or at the entrance of the cochlear and you have low frequency sensitivity at the distal end. Um, so uh, all the way up at the end of that snail house shaped structure. In the auditory nerve, it's not that clear. We need to know which electrode in which and located in which area of the nerve would stimulate specific frequencies in order for us to develop stimulation algorithms and in order to convey sound and speech information in a reliable way. This is, and so this experiment uh, was done as a proof of concept and to map the tonotopy of the auditory nerve. And we saw exactly what uh, we're anticipating. Um, I hope I won't lose anyone in this. It gets a little more uh, scientific here, but um, what you can see here in that little pixelated diagram is the number of spikes or action potentials that were recorded from the midbrain. And so by stimulating a single electrode and slowly increasing the current level or the amount of electrical charge that we deliver, uh, you can see that it first activates a very specific frequency. It's just one pixel. As you increase the current, this becomes more like the activation pattern becomes more of a funnel shaped um, a structure. And this makes sense because if you increase the current, you deliver more charge, you will activate more nerve fibers, more neurons in the vicinity of the electrode hence also activating different uh, frequencies um, for the sound information. So that proves two things. First, we can very selectively stimulate a very, very narrow frequency band with very, very few uh, current or little current. So as a comparison, um, here we saw activation thresholds of about 20 microamps and in some uh, microamperes and in certain applications even less. As a comparison, cochlear implants require at least a factor uh, or an order of magnitude higher to activate uh, neurons just because the charge has to overcome um, the, the bony wall of the cochlear. So cochlear implants typically stimulate at several hundreds of microamps. And the other thing that we learned from this is the tonotopy of the auditory nerve, which um, is based, which is coded here in different colors. So you have low frequencies that are located in the center uh, portion of the auditory nerve. And then similar to the cochlear, uh, looking at the cross section, you slowly, when you spiral out to the outer surfaces, outer area of the nerve, uh, you increasingly become sensitive to higher frequencies. The next step in order to um, move towards a clinical trial is you have to demonstrate safety and efficacy of the device. So for this reason, um, with our partners, we are working on CAT models and non-human primate uh, models. The CAT models are mostly for uh, safety. 
Um, it is a model where you can relatively easy, e relatively easily access the auditory nerve and implant the device. Um, one of the limitations here, however, is it doesn't um, really mimic the use case very well. Cats do not walk upright. Uh, they tend to um, scrape off anything foreign uh, on their body. So we had, and the anatomy of the skull is substantially different compared to a human, obviously. So even the skull is so small that we cannot place our sound processor, the microphone, and even the, the implantable stimulator on the skull. So we had to be a little creative there. And what our partners at the University of Utah and West Virginia University came up with was a backpack system. So the cat would work, wear all the electronics um, in a backpack uh, with a cable then leading to a connector that sits on the top of the head. We still do have to conduct a couple of experiments on non-human primates. Um, and this is just to mimic the end use case in the best way possible. So this is the next slide why we, where I kind of want to show to you why we used this, uh, this model. And this is just really the very similar anatomy between, uh, in this case, uh, rhesus macaque models and uh, the human uh, anatomy. So you can see here, this is a cochlear, the small structure. It's that little dark shaded area. You have the internal auditory canal, IAC really similar, same with the labyrinth and the sigmoid sinus. So those are important because these are the landmarks that the surgeons are using when per performing a surgery uh, and exposing the auditory nerve. So I would like to, the last portion of the, the, the presentation is uh, very exciting results. Um, we did just two months ago, uh, conduct our first experiments in patients and humans um, in an intraoperative setting. So this was not a chronic study yet, but um, we were able, so this was work that was done directly between us, BlackRock and um, the medical high school in Hanover, which is home to the biggest hearing center in Europe. So what we did is uh, we recruited volunteers, um, patients that had uh, to go through an acoustic neuroma surgery. So this is basically a surgery that removes uh, cancerous tissue um, or tumors uh, that are located on the auditory nerve or the vestibular nerve that runs right parallel to the auditory nerve. Um, and so patients that have to undergo this procedure, in this case, the auditory nerve is exposed already and um, they have agreed uh, to a couple of minutes of additional anesthesia time for us to insert the microelectrode array, stimulate the auditory nerve and record the responses of the brainstem um, uh, as a result from this electrical stimulation. So this proved to us, yes, it works in humans. We can activate the auditory pathway by stimulating directly from within the nerve. It is a safe procedure. Surgeons are comfortable implanting the device. And so this is a study that is still ongoing, but we've had very, very promising results over the last two weeks. So as a setup, you can see we have our little electrode array implanted into the nerve. Uh, since this is an intraoperative acute study, the device only remains implanted for less than 30 minutes. We have a percutaneous connector that is temporarily attached to the skull um, that then is connected to one of our stimulator devices. This is a big tabletop device, nothing compared to um, the, the final product, but uh, this just offers us a very good precision of uh, charge delivery. And then in order to record the responses from the auditory system to these stimuli, we placed uh, auditory brainstem recording electrodes. So those are just needle electrodes that are placed behind the ear and on the forehead that record brain activity as a response um, 
to, to our stimuli delivered into the auditory nerve. Um, I would love to show you some of the data yet that we collected, especially our growth functions and the auditory brainstem responses. But this, um, I'm not allowed to share that yet since our partners would like to publish on this. This will make quite a bit of noise in the community. So I will not steal their show on this. Um, as like a final overview of the next steps, um, in order to get to a clinical trial, our plan is to implant for at least a year in at least three or six patients. Uh, the study will be conducted in Germany uh, at the hearing center. Um, we did have to go and are still going through several steps. So one was cadaveric studies, and this is basically establishing very basic device dimensions, um, working with the surgeons to on the usability to make sure that this is safe. This is a, a rapid uh, procedure that we don't lose any time there. Um, we did then also, and those I talked about that intraoperative experiments first just by stimulating the surface of the auditory nerve, and then um, just recently also from within the auditory nerve. Um, the animal models are still ongoing, so these are very time consuming because we need to keep these devices implanted for several months, consistently monitor vitals, draw blood, analyze for any infection, any foreign body reaction. Um, and then in parallel, uh, our partners are also working on computational models and stimulation strategies to make sure that once the device is implanted, we know exactly which electrode needs to be stimulated in what way to convey um, a higher speech resolution. So I'm going to conclude just uh, by some acknowledgments and uh, and and our partners on this project. So this all started with uh, funding from the U.S. Uh, National Institute uh, of uh, Health, specifically through the Brain Initiative. Uh, since the start of this project, there was quite a bit of interest and uh, investment has been flowing into this project um, from several sides. But on the academic uh, side, we're working with the University of Minnesota um, in Germany, MHH, uh, so the Hearing Center, the Medical High School in Hanover, the Inter International Neuroscience Institute, the University of West Virginia, the University of Utah quite a big team. And then on the industrial side, we are currently partnering up with Medell, um, uh, who's one of the, the, the major cochlear implant manufacturers. And that brings me to the end of my presentation. Thank you so much for, for your attention. Wow, this is really exciting. I mean, this is cutting edge right out there um, technology and I know that I was very excited to hear your presentation. I'm sure everybody else is here too. And let's go ahead and open this up to um, questions. So we'd like to ask that you please go ahead and raise your hand. Oops. And we'll call on people. And Yep. Can we have more rest? Uh, sh stop sharing the screen. Yeah, yeah. I can do that. Uh, here Thank you. So, Janine, please ask your question. Unmute yourself and ask your question. Hi. Um, no audio. Muted. Hello? There you go. Yeah, I can hear you. I think this is fantastic. I've dreamed of this for decades. Um, uh, I know a lot of people like me who have impaired auditory nerve. Uh, my question is, two questions actually. Uh, would something like this work if uh, you have an intact auditory nerve, but the fibers are damaged? as mine were from medication. That's the first question. Okay, yes. And so, second question, 
The most important reason for this is in all the tests you're doing, um, the human clinical trials before and after you do this, are you testing them for their word recognition, their speech, to see if there's an improvement? Yes, um, thank you for the questions. Um, so to your first question, uh, yes, there has to be uh, at least a residual function left uh, of the auditory nerve. Um, so uh, individuals without an auditory nerve or an auditory nerve that is not working uh, will not um, uh, oh. be eligible for this implant. Um, to your second question, yes, um, there is a lot of data uh, out there um, from speech tests. I assume you're familiar. I mean, there are different uh, sentences tests, uh, speech recognition in noise. Um, so we will conduct uh, the same tests on uh, the participants and the volunteers of our study in order to benchmark and compare the performance of our device um, compared to um, auditory brainstem implants and cochlear implants in, in, the first, uh, in our first study, yes. Oh, this is perfect because uh, I just felt in some way, the cochlear implants were not quite totally effective if the uh, problem was really the auditory nerve. All the things you mentioned about the frequency resolution uh, um, limitations, I, I realized that. So it's great that you bypass and you can have a direct implant into the auditory nerve stem. That's great. Janine, I have a question for you. I heard you say something about hair cells and auditory nerve very close together. And it's my understanding that there are only hair cells on the cochlea and the auditory nerve doesn't have hair cells. Moritz, is that accurate? So the hair cells are basically the energy converter between mechanical engine, uh, energy um, that uh, travels through the cochlea. Uh, so by vibrating, these hair cells generate um, action potentials in the receptors of the, the, the auditory nerve neurons. So basically they convert the mechanical energy information into action potentials that then travel uh, through the auditory nerve. Thanks. Who's next here? Um, Carol Agate, please unmute yourself. It's, oh, there, all right. Um, well, in lay terms, just how does the result of this procedure differ from that of the cochlear implant? And does it have promise of actually restoring the same hearing as someone who does not have any hearing loss? Very good question. So, um... The, the surgical procedure is at this point more invasive compared to a cochlear implant. Um, the reason for this is that we are using existing approaches from uh, neurosurgery or um, neuro uh, neurotology um, in order to, to get our device implanted. Um, and this also leads me to your second question that this has the potential to restore hearing um, uh, or, or Im improve the hearing beyond cochlear implants. Uh, it definitely has the potential, but we are currently still at the very beginning of our development, whereas uh, the cochlear implants technology and industry um, have now had 40 years um, of development with uh, several 
research groups and research institutions improving on the device. So I would say just from the physical point of view, it absolutely has the potential to improve um, uh, the hearing experience over cochlear implants. But this is not something that we will see in the very first study, which is just a proof of concept. Um, because in the next step, we will then uh, move to higher channel counts, higher number of electrodes to really fine tune this and convey more um, information. And in the Thank same you. in the same process, uh, there will also be uh, there's already interest uh, from the surgeons that we are working with to refine and develop uh, a surgical procedure that is more optimized to the implantation of our device and that may not be as invasive as uh, the studies that we're currently conducting. Thank you. Jim Schroeder. Okay, I, I have several questions, um, some of which you probably can't answer. Um, I guess my first question, uh, I'll give you the questions then you can answer. Uh, first question is, would you anticipate that somebody with total hearing loss would be uh, um, bi uh, a bilaterally um, um, uh, have these uh, uh, implants? Um, secondly, uh, would you anticipate that the uh, uh, the um, rehabilitation for for an implant would be somewhat analogous to uh, that of a, a cochlear implant. It would take time for people to understand speech the way they they uh, they did in the past. And then um, third question is about the the surgeon. Is the uh, neurosurgeon technology uh, similar to uh, that of a, of a, a cochlear implant surgeon, or would the uh, skill set for the surgeon have to be fundamentally different? Um, and my fourth question is: um, is uh, is your company uh, publicly traded, or is it privately held like uh, Medal is? Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Um, happy to answer all of those. So to your first question about bilateral implants, um, this will heavily uh, depend on um, the surgical procedure, um, on the outcomes that we see with our first generation of uh, patients in our clinical trial. Um, we will start with unilateral implants. Um, I do not see a reason why someone would not uh, benefit from a bilateral implant. Um, the second question remind me that was- Rehabilitation. Rehabilitation, yes. Um, this will be similar to a cochlear implant. Um, so after the implantation, um, the patients will obviously um, have to go through uh, an initial healing process um, and then still um, attend sessions with audiologists where the device will be programmed and or fitted um, because as engineers, we can only do so much in the precision. At the end, it's still the surgeon that places it into the nerve. And so you will never have the implant, and this applies also to cochlear implants. Um, the implant is never at the absolute perfect, optimal, or reproducible location. And so during these fitting procedures, this is where uh, you will identify which electrodes um, uh, need to be programmed into a certain way just to account for um, that uh, patient to patient variability. But the process itself, the patient journey will be very, very similar. Um, the third question was, um, I remember the fourth was whether our company is publicly traded. 
Um, it was about the neurosurgeon. His correct, okay, yes. So we are working with a team of three surgeons. Uh, only one of them is a neurosurgeon. Um, the other two surgeons are neurotologists. So basically ENT surgeons that do cochlear implants on almost a daily if, or weekly basis. So um, the skill set for this procedure would be the skill set of uh, an ENT surgeon, a neurotologist. Um, it doesn't have to be a neurosurgeon in this case. And we are still privately held. Um, we're VC funded, um, but not publicly traded. Okay, Jim, you good? Okay, friends. Hi, uh, thank you for doing all that, Morris. Uh, you're very patient and very persistent. Thank you for working with us. Um, I don't know much about uh, cochlear stuff at this point, but I understand that I uh, read somewhere that 30% of cochlear uh, candidates are not eligible for some reason, some medical reason or whatever that is. Perhaps this would this procedure would would uh, make those people um, more eligible because I don't know why. But uh, the second question I had was, uh, have you done any simulation or any kind of uh, cadaver type of studies as to, to characterize your system in terms of frequency response sensitivity and crosstalk and whatever the audio terminology we come up with, just to get 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 us an idea? Of course, it can be. It's not the final version, but I just want to know where, what the state of the art is in terms of what you guys are going to do. Um, yeah, thank you for your questions. Um, so, in terms of si simulation and um, and ongoing studies to demonstrate uh, the improved frequency resolution. Uh, we're currently still limited to the animal models. Um, so this is where we had these two pairs of electrodes, one implanted in the nerve, one in the midbrain. Um, this is the best evidence we have so far. Um, with cadaveric studies, we unfortunately cannot get this information um, just because the tissue is is dead, is, has been fixed. So you, the signals won't travel um, through that tissue. Also, um, we, we see that the mechanical and the electrical properties of uh, nerve tissue from cadaveric studies uh, is substantially different. So there's limitations there. We are currently, and this is a test that will be conducted in three weeks from now. Um, I'll be traveling to Germany for another intraoperative surgery uh, where we'll um, use a couple of tricks uh, to determine whether we indeed do have independent narrow band frequency activation. Mm -hmm. The ultimate test will, however, be to talk to a patient and, and get direct feedback. Um, your first question was, remind me again, sorry, I'm having uh, a well, I heard that, that I read somewhere that cochlear, that co people with, oh, yeah. with the cochlea uh, do not qualify for a cochlear implant. Like 30, yeah, 30 I, I don't know if 30% is really the number, um, but in order to be eligible for a cochlear implant, you have to meet several factors. Um, so one is a certain degree of hearing loss um, where a, uh, a hearing aid just wouldn't, wouldn't help. Um, it also depends on the nature of this hearing loss. So typically it's sensory neural. So it's not the type of hearing loss where the sound wave, where your inner ear is intact and the sound waves just can't travel all the way to the inner ear, but that the damage really or like uh, is is done um, to the hair cells or within the cochlear. Um, if you if those criteria are fulfilled, then there are still anatomical uh, questions. For example, uh, the shape of the cochlear. Although cochlear implant companies are getting better and better to to address those. Um, yeah, well, I'll, be the first one in I'll be the first one in line when you go public. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, you're good. Okay, Tom Watson. Okay, hi folks. Um, 
don't know if you can see me. I yes, can't we can see, see myself you. here. Uh, there I am. Okay. One big question. Based on various tests over the years, it seems that my auditory nerve itself is the problem for my hearing loss, which has just gone to the stage where even with the aids, I can't hear words. And thus, the um, when I was tested for a cochlear implant, that wasn't a good solution. Mm. So I'm just curious, what is the expected timeline for dealing with issues where the nerve itself is basically out of order? Um, Because it sounds like some of this technology might address that. That's a good question. And I I will be careful in my answer because- 10 years, 50 years. Yeah, I'm- What are we looking at? So I'm not a physician, but I would say it really depends on um, why the auditory nerve or how the auditory nerve is impacted. If certain portions or uh, location closer to the brainstem is intact and working, then um, this current technology may be a possibility. Um, a, like if really an auditory nerve is non-functional or missing, uh, to my knowledge, the only implant that is currently on the market, but with very limited um, or like uncertain outcome is the auditory brainstem implants. Um, I know that certain groups are working on a new type um, called the auditory midbrain implants uh, that is directly implanted into the midbrain. But in terms of time, it's a difficult question. Um, I can tell you this on average from concept from concept to a marketed medical device you have to budget around 10 years of development and regulatory um, work. So I would say if someone comes up with a solution for missing or non-functional auditory nerves, other than the brainstem implant, uh, if someone would come up with it tomorrow, then the earliest would be 10 years from now. That would be my, my guess. But it's a very difficult question to to answer. Okay, you good, Tom? Okay, so Joe Helfer. Yeah, and it's just it's it's a rare condition, so there doesn't seem to be much happening with either bypassing the nerve or regenerating nerves. And I'm at the point where my family life expectancy says my expectancy is zero years. Wow. So that's well, why I was interested in the so, time. So this is the uh, just could be as uh, much as forty one, more years. Yeah. Though, so. I mean, what one one comment no. there um, is, and this is not my area of expertise. Thank you. But going attending several conferences on um, on hearing, um, I could see how a pharmaceutical approach for nerve restoration uh, would probably be faster than an actual device or implant. Um, and I know that there is a lot, a lot of research uh, currently going on. I have friends who are dealing with their issues and they're uh, so desperate that they're willing to be participants in clinical studies, clinical research studies. So if somebody's doing that kind of study, you might toss a coin and see if you want to try that. I don't know who's doing it though, myself. Hey, Joe. Thank you. Um, kind of on the line of, of Tom's thinking there, do you do you know ahead of time if that nerve is going to be receptive to an implant 
Or do you know, is that a test that you're saying, well, it, it may be damaged, it may be just fine, we're not certain? Yeah, so there are a series of tests um, that are currently standard already for cochlear implant surgeries, because in order to receive a cochlear implant, the nerve has to be functional and intact. Um, so we would and we are already, especially for these intraoperative studies that I mentioned, uh, we are doing this full array of tests uh, first before the surgery to have um, a good sense of the nerve being functional. But then the real final test actually is uh, performed uh, during the surgery. And so this is there are two tests um, that are typically done. Uh, one is the ANTS test. Don't ask me if, <laughs> what it stands for, but uh, it is a very small version of a cochlear implant that is just with three electrode contacts that is inserted into the cochlear. And then in the same concept um, as we're using for our intraoperative studies right now, you measure the responses uh, from the brainstem as a response to stimulating from within the cochlear. And then a second test is called um, a placement test where the surgeon places a small paddle electrode. So this is really um, how to describe it. Uh, it's a flat piece of uh, silicone of rubber with platinum contacts that is placed on the surface of the auditory nerve and uh, then stimulates the nerve. And if you can see a response then, then you know the nerve, nerve is in good shape. It's able to uh, carry signals. And uh, this, those, those would be the, the check marks um, that you would need to fulfill in order to, to, to get either a cochlear implant or an auditory nerve implant. Thank you very much. Janine. You're um, muted, you're Janine. Muted. I was uh, gonna mention something that I went through 50 years ago. You were talking about a paddle kind of thing that stimulates the auditory nerve. Um, I. Uh, had my hearing tested, and then for eight weeks, five days a week for 45 minutes, I had electrical stimulation, electrodes placed on uh, the bones here and um, the backbone over here behind the ear. Eight weeks, five days a week, 45 minutes. My hearing and word recognition was tested before and after. And guess what? It was a 25% improvement. Wow. Uh, I don't think uh, the company was well known. I uh, oh no, I have the machine. Uh, if I have contact with you, uh, I can uh, mention it to you. I, um, I would love to know more about this, Janine. <laughs> yes. Um, I'm happy to share my, my email address in the chat, um, if anyone... Well, the reason we knew about is because my father was a physician and he knew this guy that was uh, experimenting with it. That's That sounds amazing, actually. And 25% is quite substantial. Yeah, I couldn't believe it. Well, I was 18 then. I don't know if it would be like that now. <laughs> Okay, so who else has a question? Well, you all are thinking about it. I have a question. So why was the University of Hanover um, picked to do these surgeries rather than one of the hospitals in the United States? It's a very good question. Um, Uh, there are several reasons. So um, one is that, uh, well, Hanover in Europe is, um, at least in Europe, the biggest hearing center. Um, and it's, 
is closely working with the International Neuroscience Institute, which is a private uh, neurosurgery clinic. And I don't know of any hospital that is as well equipped in surgical equipment um, as the INI. But the other reason is also that um, there are two reasons. So the surgeon we're working with in Hannover, um, he is very, very well known in the field. Um, in terms of uh, ENT surgery, I would say he is the key opinion leader. Um, when you go to conferences, people want to take pictures with him just like a rock star. Um, so there is a little bit of knowledge there. And the, finally, the um, person that initially started uh, uh, this project, uh, Hubert Lim from the University of Minnesota, um, used to be a postdoctoral student from, uh, from the surgeon. Um, and they kind of came up with the idea together, uh, along with Florian Salzbacher, who is one of our co-founders. Um, so this is, those are all reasons for Hanover being the first site of clinical trials. But since uh, we do have funding um, from the NIH, uh, the requirement is as well for us to conduct the same trials um, pretty short, uh, shortly after at the University of Minnesota Hospital. What's so the that, name of the famous rock star surgeon? Uh, Professor Lennartz, um, Thomas Leonards. Can you put his name in the chat? Mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh, Dr. Salmat. Mimi, you're up. Uh, okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. I, um, I don't have a question. I am a clinical audiologist, and I want to sincerely thank you for your effort. For a person that has been in the field over 43 years, I um, have a, a lot of uh, patients, um, and I uh, see that how evolutionary um, this process would be. And um, thank you for your effort. And um, if I can be of any help, just providing uh, subjects in the future, I will be glad to do that. Thank you and congratulations again. Thank you so much, Mimi. Um, that's, it means a lot hearing this, thank you. Okay, so come on, there have to be some other people who are just waiting to see if somebody else asks their question. I don't think that uh, I told Morris to stay all day. <laughs> so there might be a limitation in that too, because he has other, other things to do. So I'm going to step in for him in case he has to step and feel comfortable saying it. It's all good, friends. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> Okay, everybody. So we're going to end the question and answer period. And more, it's of course, you know, I'm just over the moon excited and, and happy that you were able to come talk to us. And if you ever want to do that again, please let me know. We'll continue to advertise it broadly. Um, we happen to have a YouTube channel. And so our, this will be recorded today and it'll be available to other people to see to gain knowledge about this leading edge research. Yeah, thank so, you. There's any way, other way that we can help you, please feel free to reach out and thanks for coming. You're yeah. welcome to stay. We have a little bit of um, chapter business. You're also free to go and we won't be insulted. Okay, uh, yeah, thank you so much. Um, thank you. It was very nice to meet all of you and I will gladly share any major new developments in the future with you um, once once available. Okay. Thanks. All the best. Thank you so much. I'll Have a good that. weekend. <laughs> you too. So we have a little, we have some announcements here. Um, the first one is that I want to thank everybody who came to the walk for hearing and it was really, really wonderful to see everybody in person and chat with everybody. And um, it seems since we didn't meet in, Ju in July, it really seems like a long time ago. 
for those of you who were preparing to come to our picnic that we ended up having to cancel because it was over 100 degrees that day. Um, I don't know if we'll be able to reschedule one later um, in the fall. It, it's a lot of work to be able to um, get an open space um, based on the schedule of the venue where we were meeting, but we will try. So we have the convention. It's the first time I've attended a convention since the pandemic. And of course, it was wonderful to see everybody. I was very, very active in three different presentations. One was a leadership uh, training for chapter leaders. Um, we also had, as all of you who are part of the DV chapter already know, um, I sit on the HLAA Get in the Hearing Loop Committee, and we have our annual meeting at the convention for manufacturers, installers, researchers, and advocates. And also Sherry Parazzoli, Juliet Sturkins, and I um, gave a presentation about the new tools that we've created for um, hearing loop accessibility. And you can see the picture up in the right. I'm holding up our new handbook. And here's the handbook. It's over 150 pages. And I can completely, absolutely tell you it was a complete labor of my, labor of love on my part and took five years to create. If I'd had any idea how long and extensive it had been, I probably would have completely passed on that. But you know, fools rush in, right? And now we have now we have a really wonderful all-in-one document, completely inclusive for everybody. And Sherry Parazzoli and I got the HLAA Get in the Hearing Loop Award at the convention. And this is the latest, this is the blurb that's recently been published um, for people to see who the award nominees were and what we got a nomination for. So I'm really proud of this. So I wanted to share my joy with all of you. We have upcoming events. So historically, September has always been the month that we talk about emergency planning because in California, it's you know earthquake season. And I give that presentation and we'll be having it again um, this year on September 2nd. On October 7th, uh, Ferenc's also been able to have a contact Johns Hopkins about some hearing research. We're hoping to, that we can uh, make that connection come to fruition. November, we're not exactly sure what's going to happen, but in December, Gail Hannon is going to be here. I think that you might remember that she was going to be here last year at this time, but she got sick. So she couldn't come and she's going to be talking about the book she co-authored with Sherry Eberts, which is called The Way I Hear It, A Life with Hearing Loss. Now, Sherry and Gail were um, hoping to be able to reschedule earlier in the year, but by the time we coordinated times and everything, the slots that they were available weren't available for us to have them give a presentation. So um, please remember to come uh, and listen. Gail is just wonderful, no matter what she's talking about, and I'm sure that there will be uh, wonderful humor that she's noted for. I'd like to remind everybody that we have a YouTube channel, and all of our presentations for the last several years, at, at least beginning with the pandemic, are all on there. We're looking for um, people who would be interested in the programs committee, so um, I'm on it. Zohar Chiba, who's not here today, is on the, um, who's the lead for that, Alan Katsura, um, Ferenc, and uh, Jim Schroeder. So if anybody else would like to join us, please contact Zohar. And all of you know I'm a diet in the wool advocate, and I'm always looking for people to, who might be interested in advocating with me. I'm currently working on a project with Robin Miller for the East Bay chapter to get part of a school um, that they're doing a new construction on it and getting it looped. And I have some wonderful advocacy news to share with you um, for, oh gosh, I'm thinking five years plus. Um, for those of you who don't know, I do at least eight outreach events in the community every year. And Meals on Wheels approached me about were there hearing 
devices for doorbells for people with hearing loss. And ever since then, I've been trying to actually really make contact with the executive director and to talk to them about that, to hopefully be able to have a project that we could co-partner to provide um, doorbells for the clients who have meals on wheels who are hard of hearing. And their demographic is people over 60. So you imagine that's a lot of people. So this past week, I gave my first presentation to them about hearing loss awareness was very well received. The conversation has started. Um, the uh, executive director for Meals on Wheels also sits on the Commission for Aging for our county, and she's in, in the process of introducing me to the um, lead of that committee. And so we're really starting some whole doors are opening to raise awareness throughout our county. And so that's really exciting for me. So Tom, will you have a question? Uh, yeah, simple one. Um, could you put the um, location of the YouTube video in the chat, please? Yeah, Alan. Yeah, that one. Yeah. So Tom, oh, something that I'm just gonna mention to you, um, with your computer, you can take screenshots of slides all the time. So I frequently take screenshots of slides that I wanna know the information about. So I'm just mentioning that to you to broaden your awareness of what's available that. to you. Yeah. Hang on a second. Okay. So we also have a new website since the beginning of the year. We'd like to remind everybody that we are a member organization and that even though our meetings are open to the public, it's nice to have our membership increase so that you're showing us that our programming and the things that we're doing are of value to you. And that's all I have to say today. Is there anybody else who has any special news that they'd like to share something wonderful happening for them? This is your time to speak up. Susan Beck, hi. And unmute yourself, please. You're still mute. Okay, the bottom left-hand corner with a microphone, click on that with your mouse. I'm sorry. There you go. You'd think I'd know by now. I just wasn't quick enough on the phone to get the picture of the YouTube site. Can you show it again? Uh-huh, hold still. And Alan, on our yes, website, we have a link to the YouTube channel, oh, right? Okay. Alan, are you there? Oh, Alan put it in the chat. But anyway, so if you can't remember some things, we have almost everything on our website. So please make sure to go visit there. Claudia. Hi, I'm new to, um, it's nice to meet you, Anne. I'm really new to HLAA. Um, I'm in Oakland, so I've gone to a few of the Oakland chapter meetings, East Bay chapter meetings, but gotten to know Robin Miller fairly well, and she recommended I try this one out as well. Um, I grew up with a severe to profound hearing loss from birth, and I've recently written a memoir about that experience of growing up with a hearing loss and the impact of that. Gail Hannon has done a blurb for me for that book, which is exciting. It's coming out next May, 2024. Um, and it's also about my relationship with my complicated German refugee family. And, but really just uh, the honest, painful, truthful experience of what that's like living with a hearing loss and the impact of that. Um, and also the changes that have happened from the very big primitive hearing aids I wore when I was a little kid to the, the sophisticated hearing aids that they have now and closed captioning and more awareness of, of hearing disabilities and all of that. Um, and I grew up very isolated in the mainstream world where I struggled and I did not meet other people with hearing loss or deafness 
until later in my adulthood. So this is kind of my foray into getting to know more people who have gone through a similar experience than I did because I was very alone with it when I was growing up. So anyway, I just wanted to introduce myself and say hello and that I'm really glad to be here. You're not alone anymore. You've got all of us. Yes, thank you. That and means a welcome lot. Welcome and thanks for coming. Um, I'd like to just mention to you that we have many chapter members with cochlear implants. And so I have two of them, Susan Beck has them, Bob Zastro, to name a few. And so if you have any questions or interest in that, we're all open to talk about our experience with you just so that you know, for you, Claudia, or anybody else that's here. So we're at the bewitching hour. It's 1131. We would be remiss if we didn't thank our captioner who provided these excellent, wonderful captions today and also the state of California for providing them for free for us. So thank you very much. And we'll see you again next month.